I've been uh, obviously interested in uh, KIP computers uh, from the 1970s, um, most of the British ones, as you'll see a lot on the channel. But uh, obviously, having you know, got hold of the Heathkit H8, um, I have been uh, an eye to the this the ET3400, which is their microprocessor trainer, um, sort of along the lines of. Uh, what you would uh, the the original idea I suppose of the scrumpy uh, and other little single board computers. So um, I've kept an eye open for them. They don't they they were available in the United Kingdom, um, uh, as we'll see. Uh, but they they don't turn up that often. Um, and most of them the ET thirty four hundred A model, which are if you're looking in the US are. Um, 110 volt only now obviously this has got a, um, a us plug on it but uh because it's the et3400 it was misled uh, labeled on uh, the ebay listing as being an a which it wasn't and it came with a, a 201 electronic project kit which unfortunately suffered some damage on the way here but we'll uh, take a look at that in another video but as i said this was mislabeled um, and is actually an ET3400, not the A, which means it can be converted to 240 volts. You can just about see it here, um, and will either 50 or 100 hertz. So I I took the plunge and bought it through the in, um, delivery through the international shipping program, um, where it spent about 10 days in limbo with it, saying international shipping, saying it's shipped to the inter international partner, and me saying um, we're waiting for it. And then one morning is we've had it. Uh, we'll update you and then the next day it arrived before the site got a chance to update so um, reasonably painless apart from a little bit of damage um, and some hefty import fees so let's take a little bit of a look at the uh, history of this device um, and where it came from now um, there's a couple of sites so all the links will be down below the video um, the vintage computer comms got one which has got a nice uh, picture of the uh, actual cover for the, the trainer this is the 595 um, they say 1976 but I, that date's repeated a few places on the internet I don't think it's quite right um, but it is a, um, a Motorola 6800 and it's uh, 1 uh, megahertz it's not crystal controlled in the early version this one uh, it's got 256 bytes of 2.1 and 2x4 ram um, and you can add another two as well to make your 512 and then you've got a lot more that you can do which allows you to add um, a lot more memory with an expansion box and things like that called the ETA3400 I think it is so they're quite nice um, uh, the, uh, this site decode systems repeats the uh, 1976 introduction date um, but does go into the fact that the EDA models came with different uh, types of uh, microprocessor later, the 6808 and the 6802 models. So um, they keep an eye open with the, the later A ones. Um, and of course starts to go into what was really quite important for this, which is the um, uh, the fact it was sold with a, a kit. Uh, with with the kit of the trainer, it usually went with um, an online a training course that was available then. Um, not online, obviously. It was a uh, quite an interesting one. We'll take a look at it. Um, and uh, it's an interesting bit here from Bob Furto, who uh, actually designed the experiments for the course and did them all uh, there on the, the exercise and the TI silence. It's quite an interesting point. Again, linked to the site. Um, so the nineteen seventy six um, uh, assertion, I think, is wrong. Um, if we look at the uh, Heathkit uh, 1976 catalogue, um, if we, uh, I did actually while I was browsing through it, um, for those who know the channel, uh, what a surprise we find, oops, if I go back, if we, uh, we find here in the corner is our friends the Logix Cosmos uh, added to it, indeed this is December 1976, so the new experimenter kits uh, from Logix have uh, been added in and it's the uh, uh, the super electronics one which we've looked at uh, the computer which we've also looked at in another video and the electrics one which we yet to look at so uh, quite fascinating and I believe it's on page 94 that we find the um, the Heathkit continuing education series books and these are the ones which you can see the shape of the trainer unit um, that does appear in, um, I think, uh, the earlier 1974 catalogue where they've got it as a breadboard as it's first launched. So um, the actual kit we're interested in has got the Digital Techniques Advanced Programme. 
so it, this really isn't yet um they're not not they're not launching this at the, this time so i'm fairly certain it didn't come out in 1976 um the uh Dave's old computers as well. Uh, Dave Dunfield's site has got a, a good source of some of the bits. He he actually says 77, which I think is more likely. Um, and is obviously one of the series like the analog and digital logic trainer units that we saw in the catalogue. And he's, he's a good place to download the uh, the manuals and the uh, uh, bits. And interestingly, a simulator. If you uh, just want to have a little play with the 6800, he, he does have that simulator hosted. Um, the core... Um, the, the course that we're, we're on about is this one, which uh, if we sort of look at them, you can see there's quite a few uh, can the continuing education series. Um, that's quite an expensive eBay listing, but interestingly, it's got the flip charts that you would have had the uh, to go through it and the cassettes. Um, we'll take a look at that later. And um, uh, quite a lot of components it came with as well. That you know, came in these little boxes of uh, trays of components. Um, and you would also have been able to take um, uh, uh, an exam at the end and it comes I think uh, you'll also find this on I think the uh, WorthPoint uh, site they've got a picture of um, there we are so WorthPoint also list uh, these um, system as well you can see with the, uh, the various parts that came with it and a boxed version and the short lengths of wire so the, the two would have been together Okay, and, and so like I said, I think it's the really, um, the, the thing was probably came out in 77. I don't actually have a 77 catalogue, but uh, the classic computer Heathkit catalogue from 78. Um, I think if we go up around the 90s, they're going to be a similar one. Yeah, there we go. And they say new microprocessor course and computer trainer. So I don't know whether maybe that was the uh, the A model perhaps uh, being uh, given out, but uh, they certainly list that as the, the whole set available um and the general courses you could see the uh, uh it's obviously our great the h8 and we've seen these pages before in the catalog they were of course available in the united kingdom so the uk heath kit catalog from autumn 1978 i'll give you the link below where you can download this uh, particular instance does uh, feature the uh the computers on the front uh, uh front few paid color pages and of course includes the microprocessor course and computer trainer as available unfortunately there's no prices in this they had a separate price list which we don't have um but it does mention here coming soon eta 3400 expands ram to 4k regular viewers of the uh, channel will probably have seen this uh maplin catalog from 1984 before um because it's included in the heath kit section which uh, i never really realized back in the day there's lots of stuff on dragon computers in here but the the heath kit section of course covers all of their educational projects the soldering course base electricity um of course we can see the shape of the uh the trainers um experimenter trainer so all of, they did quite a big range through them of all of their uh, engineering design ones and of course we we find the um et 3400 ae in this near uh, this time um and so the kit is uh 189.95 so uh that's not an uh not an insignificant sum of money um do we have the actual the the, the course here is as well um 99.95 i think that's the 3401 course so they they're both in the catalog um and they were still in 1984 so i assume they were available until later as well um and also they've got the accessories for the trainer so that's going to be the um yeah eta 3400 as well is available in the catalog and that's a uh, 149.95 so and 259 with the ewa accessory kit and the chipset 54.95 so yeah there we go something i missed uh back in the day was the uh mountain catalog and it's heath kit uh numbers so let's take a look at the uh the device initially and uh how we can uh uh, convert it to work on 240 volts uh, 50 hertz uh, rather than the 110 60 hertz I think I incorrectly said 100 hertz earlier just doubling the 50 so uh, let's run the video well here it is on the bench obviously with the uh, American plug so I'll have to find a suitable replacement mains cable 
So I've got the I've got a good proportion of the manual ready to go, but I did uh, I printed out some of the assembly instructions as well because I don't have them, um, which has got a little bit about how to change the uh, AC volt from uh, 120 to 240, which this will be set to. So uh, I probably mentioned it already, but the um, this is the, the 3400, not the A, and that actually is rated for either 120 or 240, 50, 60. So we should be able to uh, open up and change that round. So uh, let's put it back off and uh, have a little look. An immediate pause while I swap my uh, cross point screwdrivers, which I put out ready for a nice flat bladed one because they're, they're flat bladed screws. So uh, interesting. Well, that's the six screws undone. So hopefully the bottom. Oh, there's more screws here as well. So there's eight screws in. Which screw hasn't undone properly or completely? No, I haven't quite come undone properly. Okay. So we'll first look inside, oh, and the screws go everywhere. So the bit we're actually interested in, although it's uh, just a quick visual inspection, make sure there's nothing uh, untoward on the board. All looks uh, very nicely put together. The capacitor doesn't look like it's bulging or leaking. Here's the, the clever solution to put all the, uh, the mains in there. A small box covered over for safety. And the side of here there should be a little strip. There we go, that's got the fuse board and the line cord. Uh, where's that screw mounting it? I think that's the one actually there. That's, not, that's actually a nut on the top of it, I think. Uh, basically, you have to put, take a fuse out to get at the nut. So I think I'm going to remove the screws to put the transformer in. And take the whole transformer off as well. So that I can get the, the back plate off totally. So that's going to make it a little bit easier to work on, I think. Yep, that's undone. That should come away now. And then the transformer can go on the bench. And we can put that off to the side slightly, which is a bit easier, I think. We can also use the meter to test the fuse as well at some point. Okay. So I think we can desolder that line cord, can't we? All right. Hopefully the iron's relatively hot. I think those cables are wrapped around it quite tightly. Let's try it slightly hotter in a minute. Might be worth warming the solder sucker up. It's a bit noisy, but it doesn't have to make the whole job a bit easier. Okay, I decided I would uh, I've desoldered the bit that runs over the hoop, managed to give myself a little burn as well because it's uh, quite difficult to manipulate these. And I'm going to then, I've taken the line cord off now effectively because I want to keep the original American line cord in case you ever want to restore it. You know, treat these nice because this is an early model probably from uh, 77 or 78, maybe 76 maybe. So I'll be able to do that. So I just now we can hopefully just heat this up and remove the, uh, the bit of wire that's left. So there we go. No, some nice clean holes for the mains. Now all we need to do is adjust the colouring because uh, at the moment for 120 volt we've got black, red, black, yellow and uh, black, green, black there. And actually we need uh, uh, black, red only to there. And then we use this unused tab down here I believe. So we'll take a fuse that way. We basically leave black on there, move the black, green to uh, 
this tab along with the black yellow, leaving the black red there, which will put both faces on it. So we just need to move the black green and the black yellow over. That looks right. So cleaned up uh, the tab a little bit, and we'll just make sure this tinned. I've uh, I desoldered the one wire and actually it was easy to cut that one and re-trim the end on the Yes, that side is tinned lovely. Let's do that side to make sure we're gonna get a good uh, bind on it. And then I'll re-solder the black as well. Because uh, I took quite a lot of solder off to redo the tabs. And we just need to put these both onto here now, just double check against the, uh, the instructions that we've got uh, um, so Looking at the tab, so we've got black on that end, black red to there, so black, green, and black. I think that'll go on there. That's one more yet. Give it a little wrap, I think. Same with the uh, yellow. So I have no idea if this works. It's a machine, so uh, no way to test it really without a 110 volt transform, which I don't have. So there we go. I think that will be a nice, good quality connection. Okay, so. Let's do a continuity test, just make sure the fuse is uh, alright before we uh, put it back in. Yep, that's good. So now we need to find a, a bit of cord that will allow me to replace the mains inlet. Off I go and hunt through the boxes. You can see this written inside, Jim, Glenn and Jean. I wonder if they were the people who built it or... Uh, or someone who worked in it. So. <laughs> there you go. I just love those little things inside of these machines. And you can see here where the, uh, the connector goes and the nuts hold it in. Well, that bit of cord seems to fit, although it's uh, obviously been used for a couple of things in the past. I'll uh, probably swap the plug, but it's got a 3 amp fuse in it, which is good. I've just checked it and it pretty much looks like the sort of era, doesn't it? <laughs> the back plug. And it goes uh, just nicely through that hole, so I can tie my knot in it. It's a bit of a strain relief, and then put it into the the box there. They do say to solder on after, just I think it's how they get the tab to work. So uh, we might do that before we power it up. Red lead snapped off on me, so I'm gonna have to desolder the blob and we put it back on again. It's now extremely short, so hopefully it'll still make it into the position for the tag. Without stretching too far. There you go. Quite fragile these old cables. Well, it seems that the uh, original uh, this original assembly had a problem because the clip on this was broken, and they tried to solder it to there, and they'd actually soldered the cables to as well instead of putting them into the holes underneath, like, like which I actually copied their idea. They just looked in the easy kit manual. And the wire wrap solders are supposed to be down, well, it doesn't matter on that lug. And so I did it right on the mains one. So that lug, which should have the fuse holder in it, and uh, the red connector, which should go through the hole at the bottom. So I'm going to have to try and repair the, uh, the fuse clip and get the red wire in. It was not possible to repair that um, fuse holder, so I put in a full size fuse holder. My thinking is I'll probably drill a hole and make that an externally accessible fuse anyway. Um, but adaption, but I couldn't find the red tape, so uh, it's just temporarily pushed into the box there just to allow some testing. That red wire is quite short, so I could completely eliminate that junction block. Maybe I'll move the red wire to the uh, to the end block, but uh, basically now the uh, the uh, incoming uh, live is through a, a fuse and uh, goes into the machine so hopefully it's uh, we can have a little turn on okay so i'm just going to quickly test the three amp uh, uh, yeah so that basically because it's on this this plug is a total short so that tests the uh, thing so we can now unplug the total short for testing 
and I can plug in the uh, ETH kit. It's not on yet, so uh, here we go. Let's uh, see what happens to the. Uh, so I haven't screwed it down yet, just gently laid it on. So let's put the power on and see what happens. Uh, there, the red light comes on, which is a good sign, but the actual machine's not on. So uh, that's a really good sign. The bulb didn't glow. Let's turn the power on and see what happens. And all the uh, all the digits are displayed, which is not correct. Um, it is that means this uh, segment test is shut, I think. Yeah, these, these two are supposed to be. Okay, so we've obviously got a problem with the machine. So we can move on to actually fixing and diagnosing it. Um, I'm actually sort of pleased because when these machines work straight away, you uh, you haven't got anything to find the fault on, have you? So we'll pull the, uh, the diagnostic manual and uh, see what happens. But we can, uh, we seem to have converted it to 40 volts, I hope. <laughs> So first things first, let's just check that there's a 5 volt now. Which uh, we should be on the tops and the bottoms of these uh, chips. Yeah, we got 4.97 volts there. So there should be some other voltages here, which we can test with some leads. So if we uh, get the ground, and the minus 12 and the plus 12. So let's try the minus 12. It's negative. Yep, we've got minus 12 volts on there. You probably can't see the, uh, the meter. So, uh, stick it on with there. If I do the uh, uh, and the minus twelve, we got minus twelve, and if I put it into the plus twelve, yep, we got twelve volts. And just check the five volt is there as well. And I think it's the same as on the chips. Uh, indeed, we have. We've got five volts in the meter. So <clears throat> looking good. We've got all the voltages necessary. So uh, it's just a matter of finding out what the actual fault is on the machine now. That's a really good start, I think, and a, a, perhaps a good workaround. We'll put the screws in the back of it, um, but not until we finally found the fault. So uh, I'm pleased with that. All of these on tends to indicate there's a short somewhere on the segment test, I think, that's, or something's causing that. And that light clicking on and off was interesting as well. So we shall rejoin the video when we've got time to have a little look at the fault. I think that's going to be another day now, though it's getting quite late. And of course, the other thing we got to go with the uh, the machine is a, a 6800 microprocessor applications manual from Motorola, which is uh, quite an extensive cover of the uh, the chip and all the ways it's used and uh, some sample code. Um, I think there's a, you know, sample diagrams and circuits and the way it can be put together. So it's uh, quite a comprehensive bit of uh, um, support materials for the machine. So we're going to have a bit of fun. Now the ETA thirty four hundred is a box that sits underneath the trainer. You need to fit the uh, expansion uh, port and make some modifications to it. Um, I believe it needs some changes to the clock uh, handling. Um, on the rear, then it provides tape input, tape output, and um, power feed. So you've got the onboard space for the uh, EEPROM as well. Uh, of course, uh, as usual with these sort of things, there's uh, uh, Mr. Baker has got a very interesting introduction to how he built a clone of that uh, device so that he could um, uh, create his own version of the, the machine uh, expansion board. So it uh, might be a little project to do as uh, time goes by. So well worth checking out. And of course, the other one that was available uh, for the machine is this... Uh, uh, 6809 expansion card which uh, takes out uh, removes the uh, EEPROM obviously or the ROM rather mask ROM and provides its own EEPROM uh, for programming the 6809 which needs the the P for the, the clocking circuit I believe 
Um, and of course, uh, Mr. Baker has done a similar idea to, to be able to clone that. Although they do say it's a little bit difficult to apply to an old uh, 63400 uh, because it's more difficult to reverse it. So probably not one I do, but something for the, the Dragon fans to, to think about. Now, obviously, you might have guessed I can never leave anything live for another day. So I opened the machine up to take a little look inside and uh, this is what I found. Looking inside these uh, bits with the braid, it's tried to tape it off a bit. The, the tape's just gone old and, and worn, so we take those off and uh, we can just uh, put a bit of insulation on the earth braiding, just as they had before, just to stop it wrapping around and shorting on anything. I really am going to have to pull the manual up and work out how they work in order to diagnose the faults on there, aren't we? With most of the signals available from the top, that might be quite nice. I can uh, get the uh, oscilloscope up and uh, do some testing. I don't know what happened there. I just turned the uh, I just turned the power back on <laughs> and CPU up. <laughs> uh, I literally I've turned the oscilloscope on, got the probe out, dropped the probe on the board, and it worked. So let's power it off. Maybe it's just a bit poor coming out of reset. Maybe. CPU up. Oh well, that's a boring repair, isn't it? <laughs> Never mind, we can go and play with the machine now, can we? So, uh, oh well, we don't need these oscilloscope leads, and the oscilloscope can go off, and we can uh, start looking at what to do with the ET 3400. Let's prove that we can get all the test ones up. Here we go. Yeah. Oh. Do you have to turn it off when you've done that? Ah. Uh-huh. Reset. Well, maybe I should have RTFM before I started. Repair a four inch yellow wire. Finally data LEDs. I don't know why these LED lights are lighting. I need to get out a bit more of a the booklet and see how they're wired and the circuit. Oh actually I think I've got a circuit diagram in the back of this book. We just go from the input switches I held high with 5 volt there by here so I held high with the 5 volts um, so the blocks below above the switches have got 5 volt on them or can be grounded so you can turn the switch on and off and they're connected through to the LEDs on uh, actually it's an, uh, onto this IC1 so basically IC1 is probably randomly setting bits according to its floating input, isn't it? So that would be expected behaviour. We could control it by doing the... Uh, if we take the zero from there to there and do that. There you go. So as long as one of them is being done, I should be able to do four here maybe. So if I do four, I think or three rather, there you go, on, on, yeah, there we go. So the LEDs do work, they're just uh, randomly valued if uh, if the uh, ICs are okay. And that's a bit loose, that switch, it's just a cover I think, hopefully. Yeah, it's the cover. Okay, I'll we'll have to be a bit careful with that then. But the cover does come off. Okay, so they've got an initial program in here, which is the uh, the run through. So uh, if we uh, take a look at what we're going to do, so uh, examine E zero one two three. I assume is the address which contains O three. So change, I missed the change button, change, and we're going to put in a value in there I assume, 4 or 5, and then we're going to examine again, um, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then change again, and then A, B, oh, did I get that wrong, examine, 
examine. Seven, eight, nine. Change. How the change didn't take bollocks of it. A, B. Examine. C, D, E, F. There we go. Okay, make it easier for me to type. So I'm going to reset again. Auto, which means I assume we to go through a bunch of addresses starting at zero, zero. So we can put in numbers quickly. So uh, eight, six, zero, one, uh, B7, B7, C1, 6F. Don't think that took, did it? Reset again. Auto zero, so eight six. Yeah, some of these keys are not working reliably, that's why eight six zero one. I should have to have a clean up of the keys. B seven uh, C one uh, six. It's the six that was in unreliable. F uh, seven E. E zero 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 reset to terminate the setting then we do D for do and address zero 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 and it lights a little dot up. That's my first program running. You hopefully you can see the dot, the LED dot. No, can you just about? It's not a very good viewing angle on those, is it? We'll have to find a bit better for the camera. Here we go. More to come as we experiment with the 3400 trainer.